is great to be with you here on Dive Deep. We are kicking off a sermon series called Disillusion, changing the way that people see church. And what is church? Why does it matter? Uh, what is the building? What is the body? And, and what is the bride when it comes to talking about this institution? Uh, and without giving things away, uh, this thing that Jesus has set into motion. And so, Pastor Brandon, it's great to be with you here. Uh, it's good to be kicking here. Kicking things off on um, week one of Disillusioned. And so we just want to say welcome. If you're connecting here on YouTube uh, or Apple Podcasts or the Google Play Store, we really desire to build a relationship, uh, not just be a one-way street, but a two-way street in how we can interact and help where... God is leading in your life. And so if you've got a question, don't ever hesitate to send one to mike.swigert at cwc.life. We'd love to field that. And speaking of that, we do have one to kick things off today. Pastor do. Brandon. Good one. So uh, yesterday was the kickoff of how do we understand what church is and how do we have a clear view? And so yesterday, Pastor Brandon, you talked about uh, Acts 2.42 and the passage where, um, you know, no. we get this recounting of what is happening in the early church. And uh, Jeff wrote in with this question. Thanks, Jeff, for sharing this. He said, uh, yesterday, Acts 2, 42 to 47, um, and we'll we'll pull this up here and we can, we can look through it. But the question was, yeah. that passage sometimes, you know, you might have heard that used to advocate socialism. And mm-hmm. Jeff said, mm-hmm. his question is whether this passage should be read as prescriptive or descriptive. Or in other words, was this passage included to instruct us how the church should be all the time or just to describe how it was at that time. Great question, Jeff. And uh, we'll yeah. we'll talk through the scripture, but maybe face value, Pastor Brandon. What what is your thought on that? Well, face value. I, I think if you relate it to socialism, I think you're completely missing the point of what's going on here. Or either that, or you're not sure what socialism truly is. Uh, socialism is a mandate by law and has to do with the government, not the goodwill of the people. Mm -hmm. And so that's a huge distinction for me is this wasn't mandated by law. This was out of the goodness and love for each other to help each other out. There's nothing about it where everybody deserves equal wealth. Sure. I I don't, I don't read it in this passage. And so, I think at face value, no. I I don't think you really have too much of a leg to stand on when you say, oh, that's socialism. The early church lived in socialism. No, they didn't. Sure, yeah. How about the how about the prescriptive descriptive? Like when, when we look sure. at Acts 2.42, and how about I'll read this here. But when we look at this passage, like is this something that's just describing how the church was, or is it something that as as we read it, we see that this is how the church should continue to be. So here are the verses, Acts 2, 42 to 47. The fellowship of the believers, starting in verse 42 in the NIV, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Uh, end section. So so there's there's the, the passage um, referring to the early church. Is that something that is prescriptive meaning like we need to live that out or is it simply descriptive meaning this is how it was but it's different now well it's definitely how it was and to say like every piece of this is going to translate into today is i don't i don't know if you can i think i think the principle here which is is what is how we got to read this is is in principle is the church took care of each other mm-hmm. and people looked in and wanted that type of love. And so I think this is a good example of here was a fellowship of believers in a time in history where Christianity was illegal. They found ways to meet together. They listened to the apostles teaching who 
the apostles being the first-hand account of those who witnessed the resurrection. And so they really had a, a good understanding and trusted the teaching, and they hung out together, both in the temple and also in small groups. And so for them, that worked. You know, back then, that really honestly was very, very a good thing for them to do. And so prescriptive is that I think it was meant for them at the time, but I I think the principle still translates today where it might look a little bit different than this, especially here in America where we enjoy our freedoms. But the principle would be, all right, we see a brother or sister stumble and then fall and they need help. Am I in a position where I can help them to maybe, well, I don't need this and you need this more. Uh, You need your debt paid off or whatever because of life circumstances. You know, we're going to come alongside you and help out. I mean, I think that's how we all should act Mm -hmm. towards each other. And so, yes, it's how it was. But I think the principle is that we need to take care of each other like they did back then you know, because they were filled with those things. But obviously the situation's different and the situation's changed. Sure. So based on like the, the freedom of, you know, what we would see in the legal system would be described as the freedom of religion, which is different here than it was then for them, yeah. where it was um, house churches and um, it was uh, antithetical to what the Roman government would have allowed and things. But you're saying like the principles that we see there are things that are, vital and necessary for us to carry out yeah they loved each other and like the specifics maybe look different back then than they are now for sure and so maybe don't look at the exact things here but look at the principles behind them is you know they were they were all unified right in, in what they believed and they took care of each other like society didn't you know and so because of that the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved because the principle of the rest of the world looking into the body of believers, there was something different, and they saw a difference in how they treated each other. Mm-hmm. So I think that is the principle that needs to transcend from Acts to today for sure. Yeah. It's it's really fascinating, like in verse 46, where uh, – where Luke records every yeah. day they continued to meet together in the temple court. So one, there was, there was this continuation each day of connection, yeah. you know, and like how, how are we vigilant against like busyness and things getting in the way of our brotherhood and sisterhood because of Jesus, you know, and are there things that, that claw for our attention to deteriorate those relationships one, but then two, like how, how, how he says they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Like there's this almost this reference that I know like some commentators will speak towards like having communion, serving communion yeah. in the midst of their meals, like on this consistent basis. This is what Jesus has done. Do this in remembrance of me. This is what Jesus has done, Do, you know, and, and it's constant. So it's like we need our minds to be always fixed yeah. on our savior. And are we, or maybe a better way to ask it is like, what what do we need to do? How do we need to respond so that those types of principles are put yeah. into practice? Because um, man, it can get so easy, and I think it can be so deceptive. Yeah, uh, we can be so deceived to miss out on those principles, like you're saying. So um, that's a great question, Jeff. And, I, yeah, and thanks, Jeff. That's good. Those are those are things uh, that we need to really wrestle with, and as we respond to God's leading to to be obedient, to continue to carry out, you know, those principles of how they had those components of their gatherings, you know, they had teaching, there was fellowship, Mm -hmm. there's breaking of bread, and then there was prayers. And so um, those are things that continue to be necessities of our time together. And then the beautiful thing, kind of segueing in, (laughs) let's, let's just jump in. So what is the church? So we're talking about, okay, Acts 2, 42 to 47. Let's talk about what is the church? What are, you know, where do yep. we start with that? You, you talked about Christ's ecclesia. Yeah, the ecclesia. Yeah. And that's just a calling out of a people 
for a specific purpose to hear a specific message. Uh huh. So if you think about it in that realm, Jesus is literally calling on the disciples to be set apart to teach that and for that to establish a people who can spread the message of Jesus. And so they're gathered together. It's an assembly, the ecclesia. The original context is a gathering together or of a called out people for a specific purpose and plan and mission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's at a base level what the church is and how Jesus establish the church yeah so uh, this this whole thing that jesus is building his ecclesia on this rock let's talk mm. about the rock what, yeah, what yeah. is the rock i mean really a lot of commentators have different views on the rock like it's peter it's it's the confession um and so i read on on this rock i will build my church is off of the confession of peter and yes, Peter, because we see that he is going to be giving a lot of these messages when the Holy Spirit falls on the people. His teaching is going to be very, very important of establishing Christ's church. Mm -hmm. But Jesus also used Paul as well to do the same thing, to do the work, to spread the message of the gospel as well. But Peter was one of the, that, I'm going to use you, you are the rock that I'm going to build the church upon i think you can take it a little bit too far with that but i think jesus was more so wanting listen on your confession that you just made your heart i'm gonna build on that and i need you the rock to to spread that type of faith and then i'll continue to build on you peter so you're yes you're the rock but then there's going to be other rocks that are going to have to be built upon me which is a cornerstone. So that's kind of how I view that. I don't know what your what your thought on that. Yeah, I mean, like it's it, kind of that that whole. Uh, it's easy to read that and be like, oh, is he, he's talking like to Peter and about Peter. But it's like, well, yeah, the Peter's church the is most not important, de- right? And it's like it's like, well, the church is not dependent upon one person. It's like yeah. rather how privileged was Peter to be a part of that? Where Jesus is saying, on this declaration you made about me being the Messiah. Yeah. That's what builds the church because, like you said, an ecclesia is a gathering for a specific purpose. There's tons of ecclesias. One happens at Beaver Stadium every every right, season, yeah. 110,000 people. To that's an ecclesia yeah, yeah. around yep. the Nittany Lions. Taylor Swift has them, you know, at the Eras Tour and all these types of things. And so yeah. the, the difference is for us, and may we seek his grace and mercy that it is this and only this we gather together because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross revealing the mm-hmm. father so that we're filled with the holy spirit and if it's anything other than that it's it's a right. you know blown to the wind definition of church because it's it's church but not the one that Jesus came to, to design yes, and the to church move forward. we want it to be yeah like so how dangerous is that you know so yeah it's dangerous uh, so i mean like yeah Jesus saying on this rock I'll build my church is that that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the anointed one who came to free the yeah. captives, give sight to the blind. And, and it was pointed at Peter because Peter's the one that made the declaration. Who made the declaration. So yeah. so like it just makes me think, you know, here for us, you know, as as we're listening together and having this conversation, like what are the things that God is sharing and revealing to you that he's gonna use for building his kingdom? You know, because Peter right. was a part of that, you know, Jesus is the chief cornerstone and then there's others that are built around it, you know, yeah. around him. And so he's the one that sets that trajectory for us. And so as God is guiding our lives, he wants to use that, not that it's a stopgap, but really it's a checkpoint to where other people are like, man, God's awesome. Like, cause he's Peter, wait, tell me more about that. You know, and through mm. Peter saying that, then there's right. this reception of grace that's been given and passed along so you know it's be a blessing as you've been blessed type of a thing so yep. so church today there's a lot of different viewpoints and the stats you shared are pretty profound you know from this are interesting right yeah yeah um the what hope is there what do they hope for in a christian um most people want people who listen without judgment or is honest about their doubts um, man, what does that say about like the need for transparency or doesn't force a conclusion? You know, these are things that are 
is so important for us to consider and really what's being said about the big C church and how do we return perhaps into alignment, you know, yeah. with what God's design and what's gotten in the way of that. Yeah. I, I think it's comfort. I think it's tradition. You know, it's like this way cause it's always been that way. I, I think, cha- and you know, a change isn't that popular. I think there, there are a few things, comfort and our own preference, I think can get in the way as well. I mean, that's why we have a lot of denominations. Sure. Is I, I don't know how far back you have to go, but it used to be like if you lived in a certain town, they had a church, and that's the church you went to. Mm-hmm. That's the pastor that guided the the morality basically in that town. Like, why do you go to that? Well, because I live there. You know, now how many churches are in each town? How many theologies are in each town? And then you get even broader where you have the internet where you don't have to go to any physical location to get theology from a pastor. And so it's just like it's blown up from this, you know, more simple, I guess, where you have you listen to this pastor, you know, and you go to church with your neighbors. You're doing life together in the community with with your neighbors at that church. Then just as we've expanded, it's, you know, multiple churches because, oh, we disagree on women in ministry, so we're going to start our own thing. We disagree. You know, the Western Church was birthed out of the Methodist Church because of slavery. I mean, that's a good reason to to split off. So denominations aren't necessarily a bad thing when somebody thinks they're getting away from the biblical you know, just like we saw with the with the United Methodist Church, now there's a global Methodist Church, and then an offshoot, like another, right. you know, almost like an American Methodist Church. And uh, I, I went online and looked at the new, the global Methodist Church, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like that is, they could be Wesleyan, you know, with some of their beliefs. And so I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily, but where it gets a little bit dangerous for me is when you're a different denomination just because of something that in the grand scheme of things doesn't matter. Sure. You know, and then we can like claw at each other and get at each other. And people are looking into the church and seeing more of the differences between the church rather than what brings us together as a church. Mm -hmm. And I, I think when you look at Acts 242, which is a good model, just because when people looked into the Acts 242 church, they saw unity, harmony, and they gathered around one mission. Right. And that's just not the case anymore. Yeah. And it's it's interesting. Not all bad, but, you know, there's a lot of harm that can come to that. And we're human. No church is, you know, we, we make mistakes here. We're not perfect here. But I think that's the, the reason, I think, is comfort, preference, tradition. Yeah, well, and as you as you're sharing that, I'm just kind of thinking about and, and looking at the outline from this past weekend about you know the church still matters when disciples act like disciples and how how that applies to Monday. I mean, we we tape these on a Monday, and you know, as you know, you're at the workplace or you know you're driving or interact with coworkers or people at the grocery store, like how church. Okay, where two or more gather in my name, yeah. there I am also. And ecclesia called out based on a unified thing, church can happen anywhere, right? And so, are we limiting it? You know, yep. what G- when Jesus really was like, wherever you're at, mm-hmm. like do these things as though He were there yeah. doing them through us. And so, how we interact with other believers. And you talked about this yesterday a little bit about how we partner with other local churches, yeah, and how vital that is to. It's really vital. It, the, the cultural way to say it would be cross denominational lines. Yeah. But really what it is is like, man, how do we team together unified under Jesus? No right. matter no matter where we're at. And what are the things that almost like mm. C.S. Lewis type of a thing, like that are the essence of or mere Christianity, those essentials yeah. that yeah. are that are of eternal consequence yeah. and let the rest, you know, not get in yeah. the way of that. So really, yeah. ooh, man, holding fast to Jesus. 
and and nothing else, no one else is is paramount when it comes to like mm-hmm. how are we the church? Yeah, we we have to let our neighborhoods we have to let this region see that when Christ established the church, he established one church under his name. Period. That means no matter where you worship, we worship one name. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so let's break down those walls. Let's break down the comparison. And, you know, it's really easy, you know, to think, oh, we're better, you know, yeah. or like, I'm, I don't like the music here, so I'm going to go there. And like, you know, that's, that's a part of church nowadays. And that's okay. I just tell people all the time, you need to go where you're going to grow. You know, your spirituality is more important to me than where you attend church. Your family's growth in Christ is more important to me than where you go to church as long as you're going somewhere that is causing you to be challenged and to to go out and share the message of Jesus and that's those are the things that that I care about more so than oh you have to attend here or you have to attend here or oh this person left to go there that's okay because you know what Jesus is going to come back and he's not going to just come to Christ Wesleyan <laughs> Right. You no, know, he's going to come to all believers, the universal church. So sometimes I think we can get so focused a little bit on the little thing where it's like, no, it's a, the church is a is a bigger hole. Yeah. So uh, maybe a little bit of homework is uh, after you shut this off, like pull out a piece of notebook paper and jot down the believers that you know in your life. You know, what are the spheres of influence that you have and where are you connecting with hmm. people who are following after Jesus, no matter where they attend church? And and what does it look like when you interact with them to be connecting on and because of Jesus, you know, mm. like does something else supersede our connection? And that's, that's, I think that's a challenge for all of us to be like, all right, Jesus, anytime I see someone else that's hungering and thirsting after you, may you lead that time and may we connect because of you first and everything else is wow. gravy, you know? So yeah. jot it down. There's the homework. Uh, it's due next week. And uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But seriously though, yeah. um, really think about, who are the people that you rub elbows with that God has given you? Because there, there's opportunities there for spiritual gifts to be put into yeah. play, not simply for the local C church, but the big C church. So anyways, there's a lot of great conversation that we have to continue on this. Um, next week, we're going to talk about the building. What is that? And then after that, the body and the bride. So don't miss it. Um, our prayer is that we would not be disillusioned and provide a clear picture, uh, not here, but just us together and collectively about how we follow Jesus Christ as his bride, the church. God bless you. See you soon.